So in, um, in chapter one, we started talking, chapter one is almost like a summary, like an introduction chapter of what's to come. But we did start talking about the criteria of life and we talked about all living organisms must be able to do these things. Have the ability to reproduce, respond to the environment, regulate, um, evolutionary adaptation, that's because they all have DNA. It has order, um, energy processing, growth and development. And we talked about that. So if you're alive, you're doing all of these here. All right. We talked about the definition of biology. Remember, it is the scientific study of life. Now you got some appreciation of what this word means because of the lab that we just did. Scientific study of life, that means everything that you study in biology has to follow the scientific method. All right, so things that we do in the lab, of course, they coincide with things that we learn in lecture, of course. Then we broke it down. We talked about the organizational levels of life. The smallest part of you is the atom. Then you put a whole bunch of atoms together, you get molecules. A bunch of molecules together, you get macromolecules. Then what? Organelles. Then organelles. Then what? Cell. At the level of a cell, what else do you have? Life. Life. Very good. Then you can you be unicellular. That means the whole organism is a single cell. But you, however, are, what are you? Multicellular. Multicellular. You keep going. A whole bunch of cells come together to make tissues. tissues. A bunch of tissues come together to make organs. organs. A bunch of organs come together to make organ systems. organ systems. Watch out, some of these things are not on a, on a slide. A bunch of organ systems come together to make you. You are the organism. organism. A whole bunch of us is the population. population. A whole bunch of us and other populations living together is the community. The community interacting with the environment. Ecosystems, all the ecosystems of the world. Biosphere. That's how you do it. <coughs> all right, then we talked about two um, research approaches. Emergent properties versus systems biology. You know when I did atoms, molecules, macromolecules, and so forth? That was emergent properties. See, emergent properties means you put something together and something comes out of it, emerges out of it, emergent properties. Well, you're no different than that. I put a whole bunch of atoms together to make molecules, molecules to get micromolecules, eventually I, what emerges out of it? You, the organism. So the organization levels of life is an example of emergent properties. But we can also look at it this way. When I study something that is complicated, I will use the reductionism approach. I will reduce it to its simple parts and study that. And then another person will study another part. And another person will study another part. And then we come together and share data so that what emerges out of it is how it works. Are we understanding that? Because it's too complicated for one person to figure out how does the brain work? <laughs> don't, don't ask me. I can tell you a little bit of it, but that's about it. That's all I'm capable of doing. But then you can do another part, and then you do another part, and then we'll meet together. And then what emerges out of that, hopefully, is how the brain works. That's another example of that. But then we've talked about sometimes we have to use a living organism in our research. For example, the blood pressure experiment that I did, did you, do you think I used a dead rat for that? I know the blood pressure of a dead rat. I don't have to experiment on that. You said it. Zero. I don't need to do research on that. It's dead. It's zero. So I have to use a living rat. And that's called systems biology. So it all depends on the research the question that you're asking. The approach that you take depends on the research question that you're asking. But So in my research, sometimes I did this the reductionism approach, and sometimes I did this. It all depends on the research question that you're asking. And then we sat together in class, and we did some questions to recapture the, uh, the concept here to get you to practice. Um, I did ask you this question, what is molecular biology? 
And I will stress to you that you cannot do research nowadays without a working knowledge of molecular biology. But it's the study of life there, scientific study of life at the molecular level, at the level of the DNA molecule, the proteins and so forth. So very important field nowadays. Okay, so this is where we start the new material. So it's just a quick recap. The new material starts here. One of the common themes of life is also something called structure, function, relationship. And it doesn't have to be a living organism. Your chair is an example of structure, function, relationship. I'll give you an example of that. Let me kick one of the legs out and see what happens to you. If I break one of the legs on your chair, what's gonna happen to you sitting on the chair? You're gonna fall. You're, the tire on your car is a structure function relationship, meaning you wanna have a smooth ride, yeah? Make sure your tire is round. Can you imagine if your tire is a square? This is what's gonna happen to you driving down the street. It would be really weird. What if it's flat? You're going nowhere. So it's all about structure, function, relationship. If you abolish the structure, you most likely will abolish the function. That's what I was telling you, the example of the chair. If I break the chair's leg, that's abolishing the chair's structure. What happens to its function? It doesn't work anymore. It will not be able to support you and you will fall. I think that's a very good example here. But we can relate that to our bodies. If you abolish the structure of your heart, it will lose its function and you're in trouble. It's called congestive heart failure. That's what it's called, CHF. That's a death sentence. If a doctor, God forbid, diagnoses someone with CHF, the next piece of paper they will give you is your do not resuscitate paper. Your, are, do you want us to save you or not? That's a, they did that to my dad when he was diagnosed with CHF. Luckily for him, he lived 10 years after that, thank God, because it wasn't that big of a deal for him. But usually it is. Once you diagnose with CHF, they can't do anything about it, not nowadays at least. They ask your family members, what would you like us to do in case they go into cardiac arrest? Because they know it's inevitable. Because they abolish the structure of an organ, you most likely abolish its function. I mean, think about the heart, it's got four chambers. And because of the way it looks, that's why it carries out a certain function based on its structure. It's a four chambers that fill with blood and squeeze the blood out to empty it. It's an amazing machine. But if you abolish it, it won't work for you as efficiently anymore and you suffer the consequence. So for students, thinking about the structure of the heart and if it goes bad, you suffer that, that's understandable. But what a lot of students don't understand is that also goes all the way down to the level of a protein. Proteins have structure too. Proteins produce three-dimensional structures. And if you change that structure, you change its function. An example of that is a disease you most likely are familiar with, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia, why do people suffer from sickle cell anemia? There's a protein called hemoglobin. If it takes on this shape, for example, it works perfectly for you. But because of a genetic mutation, it can change shape. And now you have the disease. And we're talking about a protein. We're not talking about the heart and kidney or whatever. It's a single protein changing shape, causing disease. So a lot of students understand that, you know, if my heart is acting or shaped really weird, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sick. That's understandable. 
but they don't understand that it can even go, the structure function relationship can even go all the way down to a protein. The, the shape of a protein can devastate, can be devastating. And sickle cell anemia is not a walk in the park. It's a devastating disease. And all it is is your hemoglobin protein, instead of it being like this, it's like that. That's big trouble for you. Yeah? Isn't sickle cell anemia like a genetic disease? It is genetic, yeah? We'll talk about it later, yeah? So the point that I'm stressing here is a structure function relationship. Almost everything around you has this relationship, especially, of course, your organs, your proteins, your DNA, and all that stuff. Structure function relationship is very important. Remember this, you abolish the structure of something, most likely you will abolish its function.